If you want to support the channel then please check out my Patreon page to gain access to exclusive videos, take part in Q&As and watch my retrospectives before they go live on YouTube. We don't have a name for them. 87 Guatemala. A spec ops team went into the jungle. Only one made it out. It hunted and killed his team. One by one. What's the last thing you remember, Nikolai? I was at the Chechnya. And then there was a light. Then I woke up and I was falling. I was going to be executed in two days. And I was in combat. So was I. I'm guessing ex-military. Probably a mercenary. You got a problem with that? I've never seen this jungle. And I've seen most. Spetsnaz. Alpha Group. Mosetas. Cartel Enforcer. RUF. It's a death squad from Sierra Leone. Lakuza and the Gawakai. The FBI is most wanted. And him. They're all heavy hitters. He doesn't belong. You belong to what? I'd say we were chosen. It's a test to see how we do under pressure. Someone put us on this rock. There's got to be a way off it. Who would do this? Whoever they are, they take trophies. The wire with the greatest trophies command the most respect. The wants us to run. This is its jungle. Its game. Its rules. We run. We die. We have to leave. Now! Find out firsthand what it feels like to have our asses kicked? No, we found out that there's more than one of them. That they use projectile and energy-based weapons. That they have some sort of cloaking device. That they're bigger than us. Stronger. This planet is a game preserve. And we're the game. <laughs> On the 8th of July 2010, Predator returned to the big screen in Predators, produced for $40 million and directed by Nimrod Antel. There hadn't been a dedicated Predator film since Predator 2 from 1990. The famous alien had returned in two lackluster Alien vs Predator films, but fans mostly had to make do with comic books and video games over the years. When it was announced Robert Rodriguez was producing a third film in the long-running franchise, there was a lot of excitement from the fans. The original trailers for the film were a bit misleading, however. The final shot in the trailer featuring Adrian Brody had him being targeted by loads of predators was a crafty bit of false advertising, as in the final film he was only being targeted by one. It's a common complaint still brought up by fans today as they felt tricked. The film was met with mixed reviews at the time, with most leaning towards the positive. Empire Magazine gave it 3 stars out of 5, reviewed at the time by Kim Newman. He felt it was unambitious and could have had a stronger slice of science fiction, but nonetheless was still entertaining. Mark Commode felt it was way better than Predator 2 and the AVP films. Roger Ebert gave it an average score of 2 out of 4, and spent most of the time talking about the Predator's hunting dogs, a very odd review from him. Entertainment Weekly complained that the film's characters were more like cardboard cliches lining up for the body count than real action heroes. Despite the somewhat middling reviews, it did manage to make a profit raking in $127 million worldwide, and made a healthy profit on DVD and Blu-ray. Predators would come with some merchandise and comic book tie-ins that summer. The comic series consisted of two storylines titled Welcome to the Jungle and A Predatory Life, serving as a prequel to the events depicted in the film. On the same day, a sequel comic titled Preserve the Game was also released, depicting the further adventures of Royce and Isabel two months after the events of the film. NECA and Sideshow Collectibles released a range of merchandise such as props, figures and maquettes for the fans and in some cases ones with deep pockets. The figures included the classic Predator, the Falconer and the Berserker. 
also a mobile game, was released for the iOS and Android, developed by Angry Mob Games. The game was warmly received at the time, with critics praising the controls, faithfulness to the film series, and they felt you got a lot for your money, considering the low price. During the mid-90s, 20th Century Fox wanted to produce a third entry in the Predator series. Predator 2 hadn't performed as well as they had hoped, and for this new film they wanted to lure Arnold Schwarzenegger back to the franchise. At the time, Robert Rodriguez was working on Desperado, and needed some extra money and decided to take some writing gigs, and had heard Fox wanted to do a new Predator film. He met with the studio and they were happy for him to take on the job. Robert met with Arnold and questioned him on what he wanted to see for this follow-up. Arnold at the time expressed an interest in reprising his role, and felt it needed to return to the jungle. Robert started writing the script with no limitations. He knew the studio would cut things if they felt it was too costly. He kept the jungle idea, but set it on an alien world. He had different tribes of predators at war with each other, and featured a predator being crucified. Rodriguez presented the script to the studio, but they said what he had written would be too expensive to film and Arnold had decided he didn't want to return to the series and wanted to make other films and not repeat himself with another Predator movie. So the idea of a third movie was scrapped and the script was filed away, and Fox decided in the next coming years to focus their attention on Alien vs Predator, as the comic books and video games had become very popular. The Predator would eventually return to the big screen in two AVP films in 2004 and 2007. Fifteen years after Robert had written his script, Fox felt it was a good time to return to the Predator series, and found Robert's old script and called him up, asking if he wanted to get involved. Robert was happy to, but was unsure if he was going to direct it, as his schedule was a bit tight to take on the role, as he was working on Machete. He knew they couldn't film his original script, and it needed another rewrite, and got two writers on board to tighten it up and streamline the story. They keep the budget to a reasonable amount, roughly $40 million, surprisingly the same cost as AVP Requiem. Rodriguez wanted this film to follow on from the first Predator film, and ignore the events of Part 2 and the AVP films, and didn't make any attempts to draw inspiration from the long-running comic book series. It would end up being a soft reboot of the franchise. Robert signed on as a producer, and his company Troublemaker Studios would handle the production, so he had more creative control over the film, and he hired Hungarian filmmaker Nimrod Antel to direct the film, as Robert was impressed with his work, especially on the movie Control. He needed a director who could handle a character-driven story, can achieve a lot on a modest budget, and bring a unique visual style to the film. Antel and Rodriguez specifically wanted to avoid casting actors who were known for action films and those types of roles. They wanted to go in a different direction having soldiers who were wiry and tough rather than big muscular men. The director thought casting a physically Schwarzenegger-esque character in the lead would have done the original film a disservice, because they were not trying to remake or copy the original film. Antel said he could make anybody look tough, what he can't do is teach them how to act. This is why Oscar winner Adrian Brody was approached to star in Predators. Adrian plays as Royce, a former US Special Operations Forces veteran turned mercenary who reluctantly becomes the leader of the group. Brody loved the original 1987 film and viewed his role as a challenge, wanting to bring a complexity to the character that would contrast with Schwarzenegger's role in the original film. Adrian is a total stranger to action movies. He had a role in Peter Jackson's King Kong a few years earlier, but he was a familiar face of art house features and period dramas. He won an Academy Award at the age of 29 for The Pianist. He had mentioned he would be interested in doing a sequel to Predators, but with a recent Predator film by Shane Black going in a different direction, I think the idea of Adrian returning has been scrapped. Alice Braga plays as Isabel, a professional sniper. Being the only female character, Isabel plays the role of a peacemaker, keeping the team together and trying to avoid any conflict with them to find a way off the planet. For training, she read a sniper manual to prepare for the role and carried a 14-pound sniper rifle during the shoot. Alicia has starred in a string of successful films such as City of God, I Am Legend and Elysium. Topher Grace stars as Edwin, a doctor who does not seem to belong amongst a group, until it's revealed that he's a psychopathic killer. Topher loved the original film but wasn't a fan of Predator 2 and the AVP films, and was a bit reluctant at first to star in the movie, but once reading the script, he felt this was like Aliens to Alien, and felt it would be the sequel they never got to the original film. Topher is best known for his role in that 70s show, and playing as Venom in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3. You can't have a Robert Rodriguez production without Danny Trejo, who plays as Cochillo, a ruthless enforcer for the Mexican drug cartel, who sadly doesn't last long in the film, as he is the first victim and is used to lure the others into a trap. 
Danny was originally not going to be in it. But as he read the script and it described a Danny Trejo-like character, he said he knows a Danny Trejo character, that's me. Walton Goggins stars as Stans, a death row inmate who was scheduled to be executed, responsible for 38 murders and an admitted rapist. Walton's character does have elements of Bill Paxton's character from Aliens and Predator 2 due to his constant swearing and big ego. Walton has had a strong career on TV and has become a movie star in his own right. Oleg Taktorov plays as Nikolai, a Russian commander for the Spetsnaz Alpha Group. Nikolai is an Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jesse Ventura type character. Oleg is a retired mixed martial artist and former Ultimate Fighting Champion. Oleg is often cast as the heavy, appearing in Air Force One, Bad Boys 2 and National Treasure. Louis Ozara plays as Hanzo, a Yakuza enforcer who is skilled with a katana blade and is missing two fingers after being punished by the Mafia for speaking out against them. Louis was trained in Kendo, which helped his fight sequence as he duels with one of the Predators. Louis has had a number of bit parts in movies, but has found more work in television, appearing in shows such as The Matador, Supergirl, and the recent show on Amazon Prime, Hunters. Mahershala Ali plays as Mombasa, a Death Squad soldier from Sierra Leone. Mombasa is the first of the group to clock on that they are being watched, and those things are gonna turn out bad for them. Mahershala has maintained a healthy career on TV and film, starring in movies such as The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, The Hunger Games, Mocking Jay Parts 1 and 2, and has won two Oscars for his supporting roles in Moonlight and Green Book. And last but not least, we have Lawrence Fishburne, who is no stranger to the science fiction genre, as Ronald Noland, a role originally considered for Jeff Fahey, who just appeared in Planet Terror. Ronald is a United States soldier who has survived on the alien planet for multiple hunting seasons and has been scavenging for food and weapons. Due to his lengthy time alone, he has gone mad, but surprisingly, he's been eating very well on the alien planet. The film had a tight turnaround as Fox wanted the movie out for summer of 2010. Filming commenced in late September of 2009 and they had a 53-day shooting schedule. They first set up in Hilo, Hawaii, that would double for the alien jungle. Once they wrapped, they continued their filming in Texas at Rodriguez's production house, Troublemaker Studios, and the surrounding areas for the waterfall, for example. The Predator Camp was filmed at Troublemaker, the interiors of the alien spacecraft, the top of the mountain where Stans meets his demise, which was a location Nimrod wanted to copy from Alien, and additional pickup shots they missed in Hawaii, such as the dog chase through the woods. Adrian was cast quite close to filming and didn't have the big physique needed for the role and was very thin. He had to quickly bulk up throughout the shooting putting on 25 pounds of muscle, so the final showdown with the Predator was done last, so he could get to the right size. He didn't realise come the end of the shoot it would be winter, and Texas experienced its coldest winter in years. The film was originally supposed to have a different opening sequence, where we find Royce on Earth. The audience are introduced to his character in a more traditional way, before he gets teleported to the Predator planet, but they felt smash cutting to him falling from the sky would be more effective, and to get the audience straight into the film. What you end up with is a movie with two acts, instead of the usual three act structure. They did address this for the DVD slash Blu-ray releases as part of the special features, including animated introductions to a number of the characters to fill in their backstories. During the editing process, they did remove a number of scenes to tighten up the running time. Roughly 11 minutes were trimmed out, mostly consisting of extended dialogue demonstrating more friction between the group in the early stages of the film. Royce shows early signs of not trusting Edwin, and there are a few additional scenes of Danny Trejo, which I think should have been left in, as he doesn't get that much screen time in the movie. Isabel was supposed to die come the end with the final battle with the Predator, but Robert Rodriguez had come to love her character and didn't want her to be killed off. Nimrod felt differently, but after some back and forth, they decided Isabel should survive as both characters needed each other, and as how the story played out with Royce returning to save her from Edwin to do the right thing, it seemed right to keep her alive. The film opens with Royce falling from the sky and panicking to get his parachute open. It opens at the last minute as he crash lands into an unfamiliar jungle. He quickly meets others as he begins to realise he is joined by two soldiers, a sniper, a murderer on death row, a Yakuza gang member, a Mexican cartel enforcer and a doctor. Each of them are armed and trained killers, with the exception of Edwin, who seems the only one who doesn't belong. Royce takes the lead and the others follow to reach higher ground. They are shocked to find themselves staring at an alien sky and realise they're not on Earth. The group come to think they were chosen for something but struggle to determine what for. Mombasa is the first to realise they're being watched but keeps his worries to himself. 
The party is quickly attacked by a pack of alien-like dogs. They take out a couple and the others retreat after hearing the sound of a whistle. Royce deduces they are on a planet used as a game preserve, where humans are hunted. Cochillo is the first of the team to die, taken out while the others are unaware until they find his body and hear his voice to lure them into a trap. The group, after ignoring the trap laid out for them, come across a camp with skinned bodies and bones scattered around the area. They find a captive predator. Mombasa is quickly taken out by surprise. Realising it's a trap, Royce attacks and shoots randomly into the camp and spots the predators in camouflage. The predators fire their plasma cannons as the group run to safety and fall into a river as they escape. Isabel tells the group she recognises the predator as matching the description of a similar creature that killed a special forces team in 1987 and only one escaped. She goes into detail about their technology and their ability to see in infrared. The group soon encounters Ronald, a surviving soldier who's been on the planet for 10 seasons. He takes them back to his home where he has been hiding from the predators. He explains that the predators abduct warriors from other worlds and bring them to the planet to hunt. Ronald also mentions there is a blood feud between the larger and smaller predators. Royce questions Ronald about how they arrive on the planet. He explains they have a spacecraft. Royce devises a plan to free the smaller predator in hopes it will allow him to escape. Nimrod Antle and Robert Rodriguez wanted to maintain the appeal of the original film by employing similar effects and relying on in-camera practical work and only using digital effects where needed. The creature suits and animatronics were produced by K&B EFX headed up by Howard Berger and Greg Negatero, who worked with Stan Winston on the original Predator for its additional reshoots. Troublemaker Studios handled the conceptual designs and the effects houses would bring them to life. K and B were instructed to bring back the original design of the Predator. Thankfully, they still had the moulds to perfectly replicate the famous alien we saw back in 1987. The film features many new creatures, such as a new breed of predators that belong to a different tribe, the Falconer, the Tracker and the Berserker, who was sometimes called on set as Mr. Black. There were also alien-like dogs used for hunting, and other alien creatures that have been brought to the planet to be used as prey. The three main predators had to belong in the same predator family, but had to be more fearsome and distinct from the classic design, but they wanted to avoid going down the path of the AVP series. These new ones appear more sleek with their designs, and two of them have trophies attached to their helmets. For example, the Berserker has an alien jaw attached to its mask. We only get to see one of them without their visor. The other two are killed without their faces being revealed. When we do see the new Predator facial design, it didn't leave many people impressed. It felt overly designed and its head being far too big, making this whole new design unappealing. Thankfully it's not on screen for long, but it's certainly the weakest aspect of the new Predators. The visual effects for Predators was handled by Canadian-based FX company Hybride, which is currently owned by Ubisoft. Hybride had been around since the early 90s and worked on films such as Mimic, and began working with Robert Rodriguez on his Spy Kid films and Sin City. The FX company had over 400 effects shots to complete. Surprisingly, there isn't a huge amount of CGI used in the film. It is used quite sparingly, but the quality is not particularly impressive. It does the job considering it's relatively low budget compared to the big summer movies that year. The most impressive CGI is probably the hunting dogs that do blend well with the live action elements and the close-up shots they deploy a puppet by K and B. The heat vision for the Predators hasn't looked right after Predator 2. They never seem to capture the look of the first two films. I prefer that sort of analog video style. Now it's too clean and digital. It's modernised to how I suppose it looks today, but it's a visual trait that worked for the original and updating it, it loses its uniqueness in the process. The worst FX shot is the digital explosion when Nikolai kills himself to take out the tracker Predator. Even for 2010 standards, it looks bad, but everything else is perfectly serviceable. The highlight is the work by K&B, which is to their usual high quality. John Debney composed a score to Predators. John is probably best known for his work on The Passion of the Christ. A versatile composer who has tackled many genres and had worked for Robert Rodriguez before on Sin City and the Spy Kids series. There had been speculation that Alan Silvestri would be returning, but it was announced in February of 2010 that John would compose the score. Which didn't bother me, as I was a big fan of John's work, and especially loved his score to Sudden Death, which is one of my favourite action scores of the 90s. Rodriguez was unsure if he would be allowed to use the themes composed by Alan Silvestri for Predator, and only questioned Fox halfway into filming, and the studio thankfully said yes. Robert was relieved and was allowed to use whatever he wanted. John Debney was also excited to use Alan's themes and adapt them for Predators, 
but he would of course bring his own material to the table, creating new themes and motives that would fit the style of Alan's work. Debney recorded many custom sounds and instruments and sprinkled it throughout the score. The main Predator theme would have an electric guitar riff added to the mix, which some people loved and others felt it was unneeded. John Debney didn't want to overuse the themes, but used them at the right moment. Rodriguez said it's like the James Bond theme. You can't use it all the time, but when you do use it, you get the audience really pumped. They also throw in Long Tall Sally by Little Richard for the end credits, as a nod to the original film, but strangely it feels out of place due to the serious tone of the movie. I personally love the score, John Debney perfectly captures Alan Silvestri's style, and it was certainly the right way to go with keeping the original themes. Without that music, it's not a Predator film, prime example with AVP, which didn't bring over any of the themes for the first outing in that franchise, and we were left with a dull, forgettable score. The highlights of John's work is as soon as it opens, big driving force of percussion and smashing into the Predator theme as Roy slams into the ground. The introduction of the new Predators as they are slowly revealed out of their camouflage works a treat, and when Isabel and Edwin get captured and taken into the camp, we see the Berserker Predators spot the old one suiting up. It's just a full-on fanfare of Alan's music. As a fan of this series, this moment in the score was just amazing to hear when I first saw it on the big screen. It just demonstrates how important a good theme is. The soundtrack arrived for the film's release from La La Land Records and has been out of print for a long time and doesn't appear to be available on digital platforms, but the CD can be purchased from second-hand sellers for reasonable prices if you want to add it to your collection. I was excited for another dedicated Predator film back in 2010. We had been given two turkeys with AVP and Requiem, and for years there had been talk of a third film in the Predator series with nothing amounting to much apart from rumour and false promises. Before its release there wasn't much hype compared to say AVP back in 2004, but with Rodriguez producing I knew it wasn't going to be a kid friendly film, and with a rating of a 15, it should have a good dose of strong violence. As it came out during my days working as a projectionist, I got to preview the film and it certainly met my expectations. It made up for the poor efforts in the AVP series and did offer more to expand the Predator universe, but it wasn't flawless and I had a number of issues with it, but nothing major for me to write it off as a forgettable entry into the series. The idea of a game preserve is a nice idea and it does work in its favour to get the series back into the jungle. It doesn't throw everything at you, it keeps the predators off screen for a decent amount of time and they don't dominate the film, which may have displeased some fans who wanted more of the famous hunters on screen. It focuses its direction on building suspense by playing things out slowly. It just drops hints here and there that things aren't what they seem and give the audience enough time to get invested into this new group of unsavoury characters who you come to like. When some of them meet their demise, you don't want them to get killed off. For example, Nikolai. It's a similar situation you have in Aliens. You don't want Hudson or Vasquez to die, you want them to live. That's good writing. In the case of the AVP movies, you don't care about the humans, and that's the biggest problem of that spin-off franchise. Despite the characters in Predators being somewhat cliched, this is a common trait of the genre, and it isn't always a bad thing. This is, however, the strongest element of Predators, and keeps me coming back to it. The casting of Adrian Brody seems to be a topic of discussion amongst fans of the series. Some like his performance and others feel he was miscast. I personally think Adrian is a brilliant actor, and I must admit it was odd to see him cast as the main lead in this action sci-fi film. He wasn't known for playing these types of roles, and as explained earlier, this was the filmmaker's intention. Adrian's rough gravelly voice is a bit too much in places, sounding like Christian Bale's Batman. The line, I'm here, kill me, often made me chuckle a little bit but Adrian in all does a good job playing the lead, and he does have a good arc to his character. He comes off as rude and wants to be left alone to do his own thing, and puts the others at risk, but he has a change of heart thanks to Isabel, who manages to cut through his shitty attitude to tap into his sensitive side. With the film expanding the Predator universe, it does it in a very light fashion. We see some religious artefacts on the planet. It looks like a giant boomerang shoved in the ground with some alien writing on it. We see some giant vehicles in the background where Ronald has been hiding out and the Predator's spacecraft, but that's about it. As some critics had pointed out, it needed a stronger sci-fi angle, which I think is true. It's lacking in areas to fully embrace this alien world and this genre. The planet seems to have the perfect gravity and conditions for humans to live, but what about those other creatures who were thrown onto this alien world? Surely it would be different for them, right? It is just nitpicking, but you can easily pick holes in its rules to set up this story. We find out Lawrence Fishburne's character has been on the alien planet for 10 seasons. Now we don't know how many days or months that is, but it must have been a long time as he has lost his mind and he is talking to himself. 
He reveals once a predator has been killed, they come back the next season with new armor and weapons, so they must have been gone for a while to train for the next wave of prey. Royce and the guests are only on the game preserve for one day, and once Royce defeats the final predator, the following morning there are new warriors arriving to be hunted. Is this now a new season? If it is, Lawrence's character has only been there for 10 days, and has already lost his mind. So as you can see, things don't make sense in the grand scheme of things. You just have to go with it and just accept it. It's not a major problem that suddenly makes it all fall apart, far from it. I think it just needed more care and attention with its writing to create a more solid foundation. It was pointed out by some that it was a pale imitation of the original film. If you're going to set a Predator film again in the jungle, then you're going to fall into that problem of repeating the plot or having similar beats in its structure. I think it does offer enough to make a valid sequel. It gives you more of the same, but with enough changes and new ideas thrown in to create its own thing, which is what sequels tend to do. I think Royce taking on the Predator covered in mud and the writers reusing a few lines of dialogue from the original film was a bit too much with its homage and love of the classic. With its production qualities, it's a great looking movie. The photography is very impressive. It's unfortunate they shot it on those digital Panavision Genesis cameras, so the film will always be locked into a 2K resolution. It's a shame they didn't shoot on 35mm film. One thing that always bugs me with sequels is that they establish a look. Predator 1 and 2 both shot with the aspect ratio of 185 to 1, and for Predators they go with 235 to 1, a wider scope for its look. It's clear the director likes that format, but also you have a lot of characters to get into frame, so a wider aspect ratio is used to fit everyone in, but in my eyes it messes with the visual continuity of the series. Another small nitpick there from me. Predator from 1987 is still the best in the series, but there has been arguments on what is the best sequel. Is it Predator 2 or Predators? The Predator from 2018 doesn't come into that conversation, as it's a mess compared to the others. Part 2 and 3, they both have their pros and cons, but personally I always found myself drawn towards Predators thanks to its characters. Part 2 is more aggressive with its attitude and has more dynamic editing, but the action throughout never matches the heights of the first film. The fight on the train I felt was a bit of a clumsy affair. Compared to Part 3, you could say Part 2 offers more action on that front, but Predators excels in my eyes with its performances and dialogue. There is just more to explore. Predator 2 has the great Danny Glover and Bill Paxton in a supporting role, but they don't spend much time together on screen, and Danny's character is very much dealing with this Predator alone, and it's less of a team effort and a hunt that made Predator work, and the same for Part 3. What makes Predators different to Parts 1 and 2 is that it takes itself very seriously. There are a few jokes here and there, but no classic one-liners or dialogue that will have you in stitches. Predator 2, for example, has a lot of humour thrown in, which helps balance the action and horror. Part 3 plays it very straight, which can be seen as a positive and a negative. It just depends on what you want from the film. For me, I don't mind its serious tone. I think Predators is a decent film. They cast some great actors who turn in solid performances. It delivers with good action sequences. The film does play it safe, however, in areas, and doesn't take that many risks, which does let it down. But it's a well-made movie by people who are clearly fans of the franchise. What we get is a very watchable film, but slightly underwhelming and just falls short in breaking away from the familiar Predator formula. But it's still a fun and enjoyable entry into the Predator series. Oh shit! Get out of this valley. First two seasons, no, three seasons I was here. I was walking in the same direction, trying to reach the edge of the preserve. <laughs> Let me tell you something, there ain't no edge of the preserve. Every once in a while, one of us kills one of them. And <laughs> Let me tell you, that's when they get real interested. See, they learn quick, they adapt. 
They're trying to make themselves into better killers. Two different types of them out there. Now, they're similar, but they're different. It's kind of like the difference between dogs and wolves. The ones that are running things up there, the larger ones hunt the smaller ones. Just for sport. Oh, yeah, they bring in fresh meat. Season after season, I mean, shit, you wouldn't believe. Shoot already! Hunt it and kill it, in that order. You said they come back. You got a ship? A ship? Yeah, it's 30 yards from their camp. How do we kill them? However you can. Come oh, here, yeah, kill me. Why? Do it now! Kill me! Hey! Hey! Uh, 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 you can't leave me here. This is our last chance. This isn't right. He's one of us. He is. That's what they're counting on. They want you to feel something for this man. Uh, to be human. Uh, 